Welcome to the Okta Workforce Identity Developer Podcast. This month, I'm joined by Dan Marma, who's a Product Acceleration Principal Architect at Okta. Welcome, Dan. Oh, thank you for having me out to the uh, to the podcast. Uh, I'm yeah. looking forward to this. Yeah, and I've been looking forward to chatting with you about the work that you do. So for our listeners, what does a Product Acceleration Principal Architect do? In the title, obviously, we, we talk about taking products and making them uh, roll out faster, cleaner, and uh, really focus on, on, on a few different products right now. Uh, myself, I'm focused on the Okta Identity Engine. We have a, a classic engine, and we're, we've made significant upgrades. And I'm working on making sure folks have a seamless transition to be able to adopt to the new technologies. But our team also works with a lot of new products and innovations and getting them out and uh, up and running for customers. Yeah, so if I'm a developer who's trying to deploy workforce identity, I might work with somebody like you. Absolutely. Our our focus is on on the uh, the workforce identity side. However, there are significant folks that, that have uh, some of our legacy uh, uh, platform or classic platform that needs to upgrade as well. But our, our primary focus is on uh, making sure that everybody can get access. Yeah, and you gave a fantastic talk earlier this month at Dev Day 23 about the enterprise MVP. And when we talk about developers, we're talking about a person who uses Okta's APIs and tools to manage their own org, but we're also talking about people who build the software that they provide to Okta customers, the software as a service that they sell to these enterprises. And so in your talk, that enterprise MVP, what is that MVP? Well, yeah, that was a great, uh, a great time uh, to fly out to San Francisco, uh, as we all love to, to actually travel and get to meet people in real life again. Um, but this, my key takeaways or my key uh, focus was around two, two main components. One was the, having internal continuity inside of your application. We all build applications and um, really building everything is futile. Right. At the end of the day, you, you have your monolith in your application and you have other silos of everything from support to CRM to um, learning systems and whatnot. They, they need to integrate and have continuity as you move across so you can have a, a really nice application. So that, that was the, the, the first component that we really need to make sure you have that experience. You give the best experience. Plus, it also gives your developers or you yourselves that ability to focus on your application. You don't need to worry about the operational side of things. So you can use best of breed, you can use SaaS providers and, and uh, cherry pick through through the providers that are out there. The, the second piece of it was, and even uh, was that experience on being able to offer inbound federation or federation into your platform from the enterprise because they've made heavy investments into the security architecture from um, identity and access management to having uh, IDPs and maybe they have compliance and all types of requirements that are, that are required for their business. And they've implemented spent a lot of time and money in making it all work. And then if they turn around and you, your app only offers a user ID and password, it seems like more work for them to manage and more complexity and, and uh, um, a surface attack area at, at the end of the day. So really the two main things that I spoke about were that continuity and that inbound federation becoming table stakes and, and making sure that you can address that enterprise. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if the enterprise has their own policies, whether it's their internal security team says we need this or whether it's external regulations that they are bound by because of the business that they do, if you don't offer appropriate security, they may just not be able to buy your app at all. Yeah, and it's. I even use the example. Of, there's been times when I've I've chosen an app, or I've said, "Hey, we we have a choice between a few apps," and then it just had enough friction for me to not be able to log in or have to reset my password so often, or I just moved on. Uh, and it it seems very petty at the end of the day, but if you have that friction and you don't make it easy for your customers to get to it, because that that's at the end of the day how I say getting customers to love your application is get them in there and use the application, not try to figure out how to get to it. You're, you're, you're not going to get people there. Yeah. Can you give an example of what the flow might look like for a new customer in an app that doesn't offer federation like this? Well, you think about that, that uh, if it, you don't offer that federation, you've been onboarded, uh, you 
bring your brand new to the company and you get handed about 15, 20 apps for you to get uh, logged into between your email, your calendaring, your, um, Hey, here's your Jira, here's GitHub and all of these, these apps suddenly multiply. And then there's this other thing that, that everybody says, Hey, this is the best at, at performing. Let's say it's a project management tool mm -hmm. and you get all of your, your, um, your, your, stuff, your work orders, if you will, from, from that. And it's convoluted process to get you logged in for you to get a, go about your business. You may not log in on, into it all the time or um, needless to say, or is you, you just have that friction that, that really makes it a, a pain and you're not going to go and update. You're not going to keep it current. You're not going to use that a, a, into your daily tasks because it's just, it's pain, a huge pain point. And then you don't log into it maybe that frequently, you don't remember what your password was. You know, I, is it my firstborn? Um, was my secondborn? Was it a new pet? You know, what, uh, I have to change my password so often and then you have to call a help desk. It's, uh, I, I, it really drives, drives you away from just getting in there and doing things. Yeah. Especially if you, I needed to post something or do, do something critical and now I, forgot what it was because I just spent the last half hour trying to figure out what I how to get in there. It yeah, just absolutely. doesn't make any sense. It's a terrible experience for the user if the company even buys those apps. Can you speak to what it looks for from the side of a company who's deciding whether or not they even want to purchase the software as a service at all if it doesn't offer good federation? Yeah, uh, um, one of my uh, coworkers, John, actually spoke in detail about this, the, the buying patterns for him, for how he... Uh, surveys uh, applications for Okta. We call it Okta on Okta for Okta, right? Um, and in any case, he, he he sits there and he'll make that that assessment. I've heard it uh, other times before, and, and outside organizations, even at, at our Octane event, where customers and uh, administrators inside the the business technology team will only purchase products that they see that have a, a track for integration because it becomes seamless. It becomes almost mindless to, to getting folks into the system. They just need to add you to a group, um, an application icon uh, gets added to your dashboard and away they go. They don't need to sit here and, and uh, pull out the instruction manual and try to figure out how the integration works. And it also just kind of gives a, a, a great uh, partnership sign to your customer base that if you have this freely available, you know, they know you're going to let people in and, and access your, your, your stuff. You're not going to sit here and, and uh, nickel and dime them for all these little things. Hey, oh, you wanted to have the windows on your house. Uh, you want to have your doors on your house. Yeah, we, we needed those. Uh, you know, think of it as a door to the, to the business, to that application, making yeah. sure you make it freely and easy. So from a technical perspective, what standards is somebody going to be looking at when they're looking at implementing these federation capabilities? Well, if you haven't done it already, 100% look at the OADC and OAuth spec. It is by far the easiest one to, to implement. Uh, we have lots of documentation on, on our site, but even out on, on the internet on, on how to implement that. It, it, it's a very seamless uh, uh, approach and it's very consistent, especially when you're going from a web app, maybe you're going to a mobile or native app, it, it can supply uh, you with the right tools to be able to, to accommodate all those, those experiences. Um, you may also have heard of the legacy SAML uh, approach, S-A-M-L, mm -hmm. right? And that, that approach has is, is been around for decades. It's very effective. Uh, however, there, there's a lot more involved with getting the implementation. So if, if you're starting today, 100% go, go down the OADC path. Uh, but you may hear also there, there's a SAML, an assertion that comes through. And that's really like a header-based approach where the, you, you get the... Um, all the information about the, the, the user inside the header, but now there's certificates and um, different endpoints that you need to support. And it, it's a little bit more uh, complex to, to start, especially since most of the, the software packages have uh, an OADC package already sitting there waiting for you. Yeah, so if you're working Greenfield, you want to start with OIDC, but if you're working on something legacy that's already using SAML, you're pretty okay to stick with it for now, right? Yeah, I wouldn't say, hey, let's go uh, eradicate SAML from the, from the industry, uh, but if you do have a cycle, it it will 
simplify your life uh, because now you, you have a much more consistent approach across all of your different endpoints. And maybe you federating into your application. It can also be used for authenticating against APIs. It can be used from machine to machine. It It's very versatile and it's a, a great evolution to the industry. Yeah. And so when you're selling to enterprises like this, one of the things that you're doing to make it really easy for someone to test out your app is you're offering it on an identity provider's marketplace. And there's a bunch of these. Will OIDC only get you into Octas or will it get you into other places as well? It gets into all of them, right? Yes. Uh, obviously, if, if your your customer has a, a great, uh, makes some great buying decisions, they, they may use Okta as their, their framework, but it, they can also use Microsoft. There's just systems or legacy companies that have uh, Oracle. There's and other providers that are, that are out there that they may have this, this stuff laying around, uh, you know, because that's the, the, the fabric that's been woven into their, their company over the years. But uh, using an approach of the uh, OADC or using that federation model, you would, should be able to get into virtually any of them. Yeah. And one thing that if you happen to be selling to customers who are already on Okta, that you can let them build on top of your app with is Okta workflows. Um, could you speak to what you have to do to support these <laughs> workflows, what they gain for your customer? Absolutely. And that's really that, that follow on after the MVP, you know, taking to that next level. Uh, we did have some, um, Aaron, our own uh, Aaron Pricky actually got to speak, speak to that. And there, there's a, there's a few different components. Like, think about uh, externalizing some APIs to doing your common tasks, everyday tasks, maybe um, even beyond creating users, creating groups, um, updating users, uh, uh, removing them as they, as they move along. There's standards for that. Right. We can talk about the the skim or you know the system for uh, cross domain uh, identity management. Uh, well, again, we have we have some great documentation on that. And then there's uh, other APIs that you may make available that are very specific to your daily duties as as, as a as a provider. It could be created. Let's say if it's creating um, different groups or work orders or uh, onboarding customers or profiles or what what have you, you, you know, the world is your oyster and what, what your application does. But providing those those APIs and those those functions that need to, to, to occur um, on a regular basis, you can expose them as APIs. And those APIs can be triggered by workflows. What, what workflows is, is a uh, no code or drag and drop type technology that, that we use that would bring your, your application not only into an SSO, but having some of those, those flows onboarding tasks that may need to happen. For example, I, uh, I onboard Emily, I onboard you today as a, as a new hire. Uh, not only do I need to, to say, hey, here's your email address and, and we're doing that federation, Maybe there, there's a, an approval process for governance. Like I, you're a part of our developer team. You need to have access to um, to GitHub, and our access to GitHub is bound by you taking some compliance software, making sure that you're doing all this other stuff. And we can trigger that workflow to make sure that you you onboard and you get the appropriate uh, accreditations back. Not even background checks, but more of that. Hey, did you take the training? Did you, did you follow the, the, the rules and fill out this form? And, and all that stuff can be triggered on, on the back end, making it very seamless to you as, as that new, new resource to our pool. It's, yeah. it's a great foundation. And from the developer perspective, by exposing these workflow APIs, you can sort of sidestep a lot of really custom feature requests that if there's this one-off thing that this one customer wants Absolutely. to do with your tool, suddenly you can say, here's how you can do that yourself instead of, oh no, now I have to build this thing that only one org will ever use. Absolutely. And, and that, that is... Um... I almost put workflows into the uh, the utility belt of putty, right? You, where, like like you said, you you can make a, a flow that's isolated to a particular group user use case, and then you can re if you ever do need to reuse it, it it's great. You you pull out, uh, make a copy and pull it into into into, into view, and then you don't have to manage the the infrastructure for it either. We 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 manage the the, the workflow and environment and it's it's a great add-on also we have that workflow builder that you could 
create you know more consistent tiles, if you will, uh, that you can reuse instead of just having a, a sub sub functions. It's a very um, very powerful platform for being able to move some these one off custom codes or these very lightweight things uh, that to revolve around uh, that friction, if you will. Yeah, so that's really advanced. That's kind of late in the journey as you're getting standards compliant, you're really making it yeah. easy for customers to use the tool that you provide and really enjoy it and potentially even get really locked into it, go, no, the hassle of switching to something else that has less features that I can do less with would not be worth it. But early on in the journey, um, are there common reasons that you see places saying, oh, we don't we don't really need to do standards compatibility. We should do this custom. We should build this in-house instead. Absolutely. There, there, you look at the, that cost perspective, but hey, I can build a, a user, user ID and password. Um, we, I think it's one of the first things we do, uh, you know, as a, a new developer, like you, yeah, you make the, the hello world. And next thing you know, you, you need to make sure that only so, certain people can get to hello world. So enter in a password, you know, enter, enter in some, some sort of identifier. Are you allowed to do this? And you bounce it off a database. And, and that gets you pretty far. I mean, you know, but then, then these, there's these people that will put them bad guys are going to come along and they're going to overrun your system. They're going to try to, to, to do a bit more. And maybe they, they use your password service, you know, your user ID and password as, as a service to vet out passwords, or they, they also can knock you down from a denial of service, or you realize that people from outside of your customer zone, because you know, you you only have a certain region that you've sold to, and next thing you know, maybe it's overseas or um, some parts of the world that you, you want to start blocking out. And you start to think about that telemetry that you need to build, and you start to build it out and all this stuff. And then another app comes along, and you got to build it out again, or it just becomes a force multiplier. And in that evolution, you start to realize, wait a second, if I can outsource that that sign-in, I can push it off to, to somebody else that, that has that telemetry built in, it becomes policy, right? I can just say, hey, I only want folks in, in on the East Coast to access this application, whatever, for whatever reason. Or, you, you know, you only want folks that are in, you know, England or Canada because it's it's a Canadian app or, or you know you you don't have to to sit here and build all that logic into it and then then you know the marketing team comes along and says oh by the way we we heard um, people don't like passwords they they, they forget them they want to use something that's passwordless and again you need to go and figure all this stuff out so what the the idea here is if you can advocate for that externalizing that session. Early on saying, hey, I know this is going to come. This is where the industry is going. We're going to need to have this telemetry and we need to be able to add policies. We want to lower the friction on the users. If they're logging into the same device again and again, hey, why do we have to make it? Let's have a longer session. You know, if maybe it's a new device. We, we challenge them for a password. So we can start to make that really enhance that, that experience. Getting ahead of that with an identity provider gives you that, affords you that, that, that framework that you don't have to build it. You build your app. That, that's what you're here to build. You're not here to build logins. You're not here to build telemetry. You're not here to build infrastructure and operational things. You're here to build your app that does these great things. Yeah, so, it really reminds me of the parallels of the shift from on-prem servers to cloud, where why would you have a branch of your company focused entirely on running your servers for most absolutely. organizations most of the time? Once in a blue moon, there will be a time where it actually does make sense to own a physical server in a rack instead of rent it from someone else. Are there similar times where it might make sense to DIY all or part of your identity solution, those weird edge cases? Well, the, the, those weird edge cases are the the, the reasons for it so because you have that legacy system that's on prem right you have this this server that you 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 know somebody's you know got their arms around and they don't want it to be cut down usually it's a compliance reason usually it's, it's an access you know the, the, you, you don't have the the you don't want to pay the premium for the um 
that, that level of, of FedRAMP uh, infrastructure because you already made the investment into your data center. So that, that it does make sense to have it in the, those scenarios, but even, even then having that identity provider provide you that, that front door, that the federation member we talked about, uh, OADC and OAuth, you can still make those connections to those, those systems. You just need, in, instead of having to build a custom framework, federate with it, you know, all the way down to the command line. You, you can you can have these, the, the right people a accessing the right things. Yeah, and when you do this through a product that's actually someone's full-time job instead of your side hustle trying to put out the fires in your homegrown solution, then you suddenly start getting all these neat features like um, auditability and telemetry that you were talking about. Absolutely, that, that that is a hundred percent the that evolution, right? You you started off. We had an app. We had fifty users. We had a user ID and password. That was great. We built it out to thousands, um, hundreds of thousands of users, and then the other your competitors are just you know doing the same thing. And, and next thing you know, people are using your your service as a as a test bed, and you you your wheels are starting to fall off the. The metaphorical bus, whereas you can push that that front door that to the walls of your identity provider. At that point, they will take the brunt of the the attacks. There's people that are sitting there 24/7, waiting for um, the, the the market to change and to make the the appropriate adjustments. So, one other thing I'd like to chat with you about, since you have this really unique perspective into these customer stories, could you tell me about some of the more extreme uses of workforce identity that you've seen out in the field? You've basically uh, uh, opened up Pandora's box. Uh, I, I, what, what's extreme to me at this point is uh, there's not nothing, not much I haven't seen already. Everything from uh, military uh, submarines were. Identity needs to be brought into to the their environments, and then they drop down for a month or two, and they come back up, so they're completely uh, disconnected to uh, uh, the, the identity where the the company not only builds uh, their infrastructure for their uh, their medical services, uh, you know, as far as making sure all the the patients have uh, have the the connectivity for their their EMRs, but also down to they built their own apps to manage the MRs that can be rolled around um, to the bedsides. And, and how do we make sure that the, those applications have the right level of access to the right person to, and, and by doing so they have the, either a, a smart card around their neck or they have a biometric on their, their body or they, they have their, their phone um, being able to offer that type of service down to this um, offline application that can that can do some validation. But those those are the, the really uh, not hard to believe, that's, but they're harder to implement. Uh, yeah, that's uh, strategies. wild. So um, for the first example, we have a system that's going to essentially be air gapped and offline for several months, and people need to do their jobs while they're offline, and then it comes back and needs to sync with the world. How? What's the architecture of the solution to that for identity yeah. going to be shaped like? Yeah, that, that one. That one was. A, I probably shouldn't have mentioned that one because that was a yeah. really doozy because it, it incorporates a little bit of everything, mm -hmm. as far as uh, while you're online and you connect to the to the uh, the centralized identity provider, it needs to be able to connect and verify that that everything's there. So we have all the services that will synchronize the the directories down down to those systems, and then while when disconnected, we have a gateway that, that, that sits there and then uses basically an offline directory that would now um, fail over to, you know, becomes the primary at, at that point. So during the duration, you know, you're offline, you, mm -hmm. you're not going to be let go in the middle of the ocean, mm -hmm. you know, you know, six, you know, a few hundred feet underwater, yeah. you're, it's going to be hard to let you go there. Uh, so you, you don't have to worry about that. And when you resurface and you, you come back to port, it would, it would, Synchronize. Hey, this, this is you know passwords changed. You know, you you've, a lot of times it's it's a lot of training. Right? You know, while you're you're looking for things to do, you can play cards or, or learn more. Um, and at that point, they uh, they they get access and they they've grown uh, as an individual and, and they come back and everything will uh, come back online. That that one was a, was a fun a fun expedition. There's all there's other variations of that one as well. I, 
can't get into, but but for in, sure. in any <laughs> I mean, I'm imagining applications in, for instance, space exploration. You're going to be putting folks on a ship and having a really long delay for any comms. Um, yeah. So that that kind of architecture would probably come in handy for similar cases of that situation. And then Absolutely. if you were architecting something like that where you needed to handle permission changes while it was offline, um, would that replica then just be able to take updates from people with a sufficient level of perms and then yeah. sync those updates when they got back to connectivity? Yeah, that, that would be the, the whole premise of, 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 the, of that. Uh, of those those orchestrations they would be queued up to make sure they sync back up to the metaphorical mothership um yeah. of the identity provider or the, the infrastructure but we you know those cases we, we do have um appropriately matched sessions we have the appropriately matched uh, uh direct uh, directories that will come down and even like our access gateway would be able to handle the um some of those legacy applications. So a lot of those applications that are offline are, um, let's, let's just not say they're not all, all bound to the internet, right? For they, sure. they can't be. There's there's also physical systems where you might need to be air gapped for some reason and yet still manage identity on it. And I take it it's gonna be roughly the same set of considerations for getting your updates. Uh, absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. One of the, the interesting parts to, uh, uh, our, our solution at Okta is we can consume and 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 just use a directory service like an LDAP or an, uh, an Active Directory, but we can also push things down into them and being able to bridge that without having to have that, that same level of, of VPN and, and two-way trusts and, and stuff. We can essentially become that uh, the catalyst for, for synchronizing over into those just isolated environments. Uh, yeah. Obviously, that's way well beyond what you would mm -hmm. normally develop. You, you can develop those things, but why when it can become configuration? For sure. And if you're providing an app to a customer that's in one of those really unique situations, why not offload the worst of the identity problem onto another provider? Absolutely. We, we, we deal with it day in and day out. I've literally yeah. gone as far as Australia to uh, all ends of, of the earth on, on trying to help folks get through those those uh, interesting situations. Yeah. And then for the medical scenario, when we have portable terminals and people circulating around and lots of people each needing to do very secure auth because it's very private information that's stored here and possibly um, for some, some but not all medical devices, it could be life-threatening if actions aren't mm -hmm. taken in a really timely manner. What's the architecture for solving that shaped like? It, it actually aligns with your, the OADC spec, but they actually have an extension to it that has a smart on fire um, component. So you can, it gets down to the individual accessing the, the individual record. So think of the, well, one of the old hospital rooms where we had multiple beds and then there's two different doctors uh, for, for that, and they, they can look at the chart for the, the bed on the left, and that doctor has access to that that record. If they go over to the, the bed on the right, they can't get in there and see anything because that they're, they're, that's, doesn't apply to them. Same thing for the nursing and, and all the other staff um, from food and, and, and food services and such. So there's a, a spec that's, that's designed, that's an extension to that OADC spec. So again, hint, hint, if you were using OAuth, it, it's not a, a big jump to start using the, that framework to, to get to those other, those other systems. Yeah, and then you have the tech with, let's say, an X-ray that comes into the room and needs to upload those files to the right patient's records. So having Absolutely. it done to a spec that's been tested where you can test your software is gonna be a huge win. Absolutely, and it, it's yeah. going to afford your, your scalability, right? Yeah, at, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, you're, you're not gonna have to say, I have a custom way to upload these these records and in custom way to get access, you know, get access to it and isolate it to the to the right people. It, it, this stuff has been laid down. Let's let's leverage those those frameworks. Yeah, and speaking of scale, what's the biggest scale that you've seen identity solutions pushed to? Billions, uh, billions of users. Uh, so we, we, we have a high volume, we have, we have customers that uh, quite literally have very cyclical access um, to 
certain points of the year and they can actually point down to the hours and minutes uh, that, that are uh, that are high, large scale and you're going to see influxes of, of hundreds to uh, hundreds of thousands of users a minute accessing the, uh, the, the system and then other parts of the time of the year that same customer may be down to just to the thousands right depending on on, on what it is and it, it goes on with uh, various things from from sporting events to sh times of year shopping. There's even uh, got to learn a lot about uh, different cultures on, on the hiring and firing procedures where where folks are onboarded and offboarded at, at exponential rates very uh, very quickly. And, and our systems are designed to handle that. You know, yeah. making sure that you're, you're onboarded and offboarded really fast. Because like culturally assuming, oh, well, I just have a given job, I'll just take a holiday and then come back to the same job, isn't necessarily an assumption that applies worldwide, is it? No, absolutely not. And, and that, you know, we've grown over the years to, to, to learn th those patterns. And your application may be one of those target applications that we're, we're helping get the right people to over time. Make sure that you align with the standards and then you can be part of that mix and and these aren't small organizations we're talking hundreds of thousands of people that are on board and off boarded in, in a matter of days so if your yeah. system is already designed to work with a, that federation model it could be another component to, to solving those problems yeah for sure and so um, if I'm selling an app to some organization that's doing this super bulk um, onboarding and offboarding, even if that organization is already using an identity provider to handle the worst of it, what concerns should I have on the app backend to make sure that it can stand up to syncing this kind of uh, bulk, sudden identity data change? Well, part of that, that, that spec uh, can either do be handled two two ways, right? You can do a just-in-time provisioning, mm -hmm. right? So as the, the users get get granted access to the application, instead of you trying to synchronize in the background, oh, you know, ten thousand or hundred thousand users, it could be as they they come to the front door. It doesn't. It's not a situation where ten thousand users log in simultaneously. It's they get added to your system. So maybe a, a just-in-time provisioning model may work for you, or if if there is something that needs the be done where you, you need that, that back end process. Part of that skim interface will will essentially churn on that, that data. It, it may take a little bit of time, but you would know that somebody's going to start work in a few hours or a day mm -hmm. or something. It's not like they, they show up for the, the, the job and, and start going. That's where the just in time comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have uh, the hybrid approach that which uh, I find very effective is being able to supply that that just in time that, that federation model mm -hmm. and and or uh, an API model in addition to the skim. The the idea here is you you would get that immediate access straight away, mm -hmm. right? You 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 need to get in there. Uh, think of a, of a quick service of type scenario you, you get hired in the morning they hand you a t-shirt you take you need to go walk into the back room and take the training for sure somebody needs to enter in, in your data just for you to log in yeah you need to have yeah. enough of an account that we know yeah um you took the training yeah this, this person took mm -hmm. the training now there's a follow-up to the next day maybe there, there's some additional information we needed it um, maybe the mailing address to make sure we know where to send your, your paycheck to because the, the first check's going to come in the mail. Like things, things like that uh, doesn't necessarily mean uh, for need for the day-to-day -day identity piece, but from a compliance standpoint, you need to know, hey, this person's part of this county, they need this, what, what have you. They, there's some uh, rules and regulations uh, about things that they need to be put into play. That, that skim, that, that process that runs in the background will update and persist that information. So now when the HR record comes along, it'll, it'll pick up, hey, this, you know, Emily started this morning, she took her training, she got her t-shirt, she's watching uh, um, the folks do the, do the work. The next day, you're, you're going to see your, the rest of your profile kick in because you are a full-time employee. You, are, you have these benefits. You can go and log in and get your discounts. All that, those other things come along for the ride later not you know we don't want to add that friction to make you know at the beginning to get you going but we want to make sure that the long haul all the data is there so you get your full your full package 
Yeah, it's a kind of a sequential um, step to onboarding where you do the pieces as they're needed and break up the work that way. Yeah, absolutely. And and having the uh, identity access management framework in place mm -hmm. with the workflows, with the, the, the ties into the HR systems, the ties into the directories and all that, you don't need to build those. You know, like the, the, one of my, my favorite uh, solutions was one where the, the business analyst was able to create the dashboards um, hey, here's the, the, the information. And they had his other um, dynamics database where, where all this information was, was held. Um, they also used uh, Salesforce Canvas as the, the framework. So as, as their customers, they provided these dashboards to their customers. So the, the analyst was able to, to create these beautiful uh, charts inside of Azure, fed from Dynamics, presented through Salesforce, and Okta was able to, um, because, you know, if it was on a legacy monolith system, they would all have to talk to each other. But because Okta was federating with those different cloud providers, we just provided, hey, this user is coming into this report with this context, and it just presented it. So it was literally uh, an iframe of different uh, services, completely segmented, and had no idea that each other existed, but because we, were able to federate them in, they had complete interoperability across platforms, cl across yeah. cloud platforms. Because when everything's integrated with a single identity provider, you can then go through that identity provider and treat the whole system like one system instead of Absolutely. like a whole bunch of little parts that need to be glued together because the glue's already there. Yes, it, it, exactly. We, that, that federation and the, the, that standard will, will pull it all, all into one, one purview. Man, and I can only imagine the value add that would be perceived by having the right graphs across an entire infrastructure. Like, here's the insight that you were looking for, boss. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the best part is, is yeah, um, management's going to change their mind on our platform, right? They're, they're going to, we're going to evolve. We're going to start off with a homegrown uh, learning system portal. It may move on to an open source. It may become a, a a commercial based, or then you decide to get a better price at the next place. Instead of you trying to integrate each one of those into your, your platform, you can just change the federation direction. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. I've had roles where the first half of my time there was, oh, no, we need to get off of platform A and onto platform B. And the second half was, whoops, a daisy, we need to get off of platform B and onto platform A. And I mean, there's good reasons in each yep. direction, but which reasons are at the top will uh, change constantly. So it's always that that change yeah and and um you don't want to say, you, again you want to get back to making a delightful user experience and you want to focus on adding value to your customers not sitting here and necessarily tying all these these systems together by tying them together you federate they, they, kn they know they have, they have access to that and system it is so cool when we can build on the bare bones of we need to be more secure. We need people to not get their accounts compromised and turn that into, hey, you can be more secure and have an improved experience. Yeah, yes, and especially across, across completely disparate platforms. Yeah, and so thank you so much for your time today. Um, looking ahead, just to wrap up, are there any upcoming changes in the security and identity space that you think will really surprise or strongly impact the developers that you work with? Really, not not a, a, a jolting uh, uh, change to the to the infrastructure. I think it's more of the the expansion of more services and and partnerships that that you can bring together and making sure that you you, you start to, to leverage the, those best of breed partners, being able to to leverage uh, the the different systems so you can, you can make a, a holistic change. Um, these, I'm, I'm assuming the the overall direction is is moving away from passwords. I mean, well, I'll, I'll make that one as a, as, as an assumption that we're we're already leaning toward leaning away from these these things we know, and and move on to the 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 things that we who we are and how to make sure we identify it properly. Um, I think that that's that would probably be the the brace for the impact of the the change in the way people authenticate, but the, the frameworks and the infrastructures and, and all that stuff, I don't think that that's going to change uh, uh, other than what we already see going to cloud, going to, to those, those uh, SaaS services. 
Yeah, for sure. I personally think that there will always be a place for some no factor to make sure that, um, because I mean, getting physical possession of a piece of hardware is simple enough and a no factor signifies intent to take the action in a way that an R factor might not, but definitely reducing that single-minded reliance on a no factor is just huge for humans using computers. Yeah, 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 for 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 sure. The uh, you yeah, know that that definitely would be the uh, uh, the, the pattern. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been delightful to chat with you. Oh, this is great. No, th- thank you for for having me. I, I love this. I look forward to having some more over over the uh, as we see some of these uh, future uh, technologies unwind. You know. And for the listeners, we'll have a comment thread on the developer forum if you'd like to discuss the podcast or share ideas on what you'd like to hear about in the future. And if you'd like to learn about any of these technologies that we've been chatting about, I'll provide links so that you can dive more deeply into them. So thank you for listening.